Hello and welcome to the network programming course of the University of Applied Sciences Augsburg. During the next couple of weeks, this course will introduce something that hardly any piece of software these days can do without, and that's network connectivity. It is not just desktop computers, servers and personal mobile devices such as smartphones and laptops anymore that are always online, but these days everything ranging from cars to doorbells have a constant connection to the internet and either provide or consume internet services in order to function properly. We will have a look at how to implement networked software and how to make use of tools to test this software. And of course, we will write lots of code. I hope you will enjoy this course. In order to make the most of this course, there are two things you really should know as a prerequisite. On the one hand, I won't introduce how the network itself works. You should really know this before starting this course. So if things like TCP, IP or DNS do not ring a bell, then you'll have a hard time following the contents of this course. Also, the programming language of choice for this course is C. So if you are not familiar with C, then you won't be able to follow along properly. Compared to other high-level languages, C has a very limited set of statements and flow control structures as part of the core language. So picking up that is easy. However, there are a few things that beginners typically struggle with which is, for example, pointers, memory allocation, and string handling. So if you do not know C, then picking it up as you go along might be doable, but probably is no fun at all. So if you feel you are lacking one of these prerequisites, you probably might want to pause the video at this point, read up on those things, and come back later. This right here is a rough overview of what we will cover as part of this course. We will start with the lowest level API that a regular programmer can use in order to interact with the network and that's the socket interface. You cannot really go lower without being a kernel developer. Understanding that interface and its behavior is important also once we leave this API to work with higher level libraries that wrap around the socket API. It will also make you appreciate all the nice things you can do and configure using this API. As a second step, we will also be looking at a few more unusual usages of the Socket API, such as sending arbitrary packets, which can be useful for, for example, writing advanced networking tools. Once we leave the Socket API, we will look at libraries that help us do the heavy lifting. Socket programming is by no means trivial and mistakes are done easily. We will look at a selection of popular libraries that make common tasks easier compared to using the Socket API directly. With those, you can, for example, write event-driven server software, packet capture utilities, or use a plethora of standard internet protocols. Nobody really wants to write an HTTP library when there is a good one already available. Luckily, there is even a great one, and it comes with much more than just HTTP. Finally, we will look at different communication patterns and how to create distributed systems using a message library called 0MQ. The authors are a rather humble crowd and have called 0MQ sockets, and I quote, the world saving superheroes of the networking world. It seems we are saving the best for last. The networking world is progressing really fast. Regularly, there are new things to learn and to play with. For example, right now, there is eBPF, the extended Berkeley packet filter, which promises to reshape the things we can do and at the speed at which we can do them in the Linux kernel. Time permitting, we will look at a selected topic covering the latest and greatest toy to play with, whatever that might actually be. There is quite a number of different pieces of documentation that we will be using throughout this course. For some of the things we do, there is great online content ready for consumption. For the regular sockets, for example, there is Beach's Guide to Network Programming, which you can even order as a real book, but it is readily available online. It is a good source of information and it is written in a casual, amusing kind of way. There is a book classic which I can recommend, which is Unix Network Programming, but also that book only covers the first part of the course. Generally speaking, man pages are a good source of information. Sometimes the Linux kernel header files are the authoritative source of information, or the POSIX standard has a good but dry technical explanation of some of the APIs that we will be using. Once we start with libraries, the library documentation will be our primary source of information. This course will run in a fashion where first some material is introduced formally, 
for example how sockets are being created and used and afterwards that newly learned information should immediately be practically applied. This way, step by step, the course material becomes more complex and builds on the previously learned and practice material. As already mentioned, everything we do practically, we will do in C and the operating system of choice will be Linux. All course material will be provided on the university's Moodle platform, where you will find links to the documentation and literature mentioned earlier and also code snippets and other supplemental material. There will also be homework where you will code small example programs. This homework will not be checked, it will not be graded, but it is an important preparation for the two exams which will test your skills using a live coding session, which means you will create a piece of software with the tools you have been using in a limited amount of time. Your homework will be a good preparation for that. At this point you might ask yourself for crying out loud why C and why Linux. C seems like a language that is lacking a lot of modern language constructs. It might feel old, unsafe to use and error prone. But C has its uses and a lot of software, in particular software that is powering a large fraction of important network services is written in C. Nginx for example, a modern and popular web server is written in C or the Linux kernel itself is also written mostly in C. One of the reasons C is still being chosen even for new projects is that it offers high performance and products like web servers or other kinds of server software need to be performant in order for the services they offer to scale. Since the system interface as defined by POSIX is also a C interface and the operating system we are using offers new features as part of or as a supplement to that interface, new features are immediately available in C whereas other languages might lag behind or not offer them at all. There is also good documentation available, also as part of the man pages and therefore readily available on the command line. So overall, while C is indeed comparatively old and does not offer many of the more modern languages feature catalog, it is still relevant today and will be in the foreseeable future. The Tyope index, a popular index for programming languages that reflects their popularity shows that C, which is the black line in the graph in the bottom right corner, always has been high in demand and either ranks first or second. Arguably, these statistics differ from index to index and the methodology behind those can be questioned. But C is here to stay, even if languages like Go or Rust are the rising stars in the system's programming area. Using Linux as the operating system of choice for this course has also a number of good reasons. It is mostly POSIX compliant, which means it at least tries to adhere to an open standard. There is a huge amount of tooling available under Linux, such as advanced memory profilers, but also tools to work with the network on the command line, which will help while doing your de development work. Also, the source code is available, which is a great help when learning. However, since we are not interested in how the kernel handles packets, we will mostly look at header files to find definitions we might be needing. Finally, Linux really is the server operating system and most interesting network software runs on servers. With Android, it certainly is also the mobile operating system. That only leaves the desktop for Linux to conquer, but that probably won't happen. We have talked about tools before. For our programming work, we will be needing Clang as our compiler. If you insist, you can use GCC but having a common toolchain is good when we talk about things like compiler flags and other tool-related details. But flag-wise, there is a huge overlap between Clang and GCC, so you might not even feel a difference. Make, you should already be familiar with. If not, that is really fast to learn. We will use Make mostly for automating our build process. You can still follow the course, even if you are not understanding or using Make, it just will be slightly more painful. And then there are a number of tools that help you create correct code. CPP Check, for example, is a good static code analyzer that finds certain bugs in your source code. There are runtime checkers too, for example, Velgrind that we mostly use as a memory checker, but it can do so much more. Then there is Flaw Finder. Flaw Finder is different in that it alerts you when you use functions that are either insecure 
under certain conditions or when programmers of news functions not correctly. String manipulations, for example, fall into that latter category. We will be introducing these successively as we progress in this course. Then there are tools that are not related to programming, but related to working with the network. There is, for example, a tool that lets you inspect network interface properties, it lets you set routing table entries, and much more. That tool is called IP. You might know the far less capable predecessor ifconfig. Don't use that, use IP. Then there is the one tool that is kind of hard to use for Germans. It's called SS. It basically replaces Netstat, which you might be familiar with, although some of Netstat's functions can now be found in IP. If you need to do something on layer two, the link layer, then either tool is your go-to tool. Then there is TCP dump, which does packet captures and comes in handy when Wireshark is not available. Another great tool is Netcat. It basically creates sockets and you can send data over them or receive data. So when you are developing a program and need an endpoint that mocks the server or the client, then Netcat will be a good first candidate. The main page even says that Netcat is used for just about every anything under the sun involving TCP or UDP. While that is a bold statement, it just might be true. Just as with the development tools, these will be one by one introduced as we progress. I hope this gives you a good first overview of what you can expect in this course. You really should be familiar with C and how the network works. Things like IP addresses, port numbers or DNS names should be something you know about. The topics that we will cover range from simple socket programming and gets increasingly complex until we prepare to create distributed systems. It will all be based on the Linux operating system and we will learn how to use various tools for both development and test. Enjoy the course.